Oh, hello, and welcome to another session of the Cinderella Circle. Today we will talk about if the shoe fits. <clears throat> if the shoe fits is a 1990 film starring Jennifer Grey, a la Dirty Dancing, and who else but Rob Lowe. <laughs> this takes place in the world of fashion. And what that means is, well, what you look like matters. Well, now, we're starting off in the world of fashion, a fashion show, very 1990s fashions. <laughs> oh, you should check it out. And we see in the background are two dressers, one friend, Veronique, and the other, Kelly, our Cinderella. She's helping the models get dressed. The models are all in a rush. The models are all kind of snobs as well. And then she trips and falls while looking at all the beautiful shoes. And who should help her up but our prince of the film, Francesco. Yes, Francesco Salvatore is the designer who's having the fashion show. And he's expecting everyone to love his fashions. But he's wrong. They do not love his fashions. And he's about to take a hard ego hit. He seems to notice Kelly without noticing Kelly because he has no idea who she is. And that's something that she and her friend talk about. He has no idea who you are. Good thing I have this interview with him tomorrow. So we see Kelly go home. She's a shoe designer and she's designing some pretty, some pretty sweet shoes. They're, they're badass. They're also fantastical and beautiful and imaginative. She also lives with two slovenly roommates who, um, Hmm, how do I say this? Ah, uh, well, they're either party girls or they're escorts because we never see them work. They just dress up and go out at night and they're constantly reminding her that the rent is due. They're also wannabe models, but we'll get to that. So Kelly cleans up the apartment. She's not appreciated. She mentions it to her roommates and they're like, well, what do you want, a medal or something? Rent is due. Hey. Now it's funny because here is Kelly in the fashion world designing shoes but she herself doesn't exemplify the world of fashion oh no she dresses very tomboyish and we will later learn that this is her style but for the first half of the film it just looks like she's wearing oversized clothes and men's pants and that's all she wants work shirts because she's working hard but what this means is that she's overlooked in the world of models where every model is trying to outdo one another now our prince, Francesco, he's suffering the egotistical blow of everyone hating his look. He decides he needs to redesign. He needs a new face. Scour the city, he says. And oh, they do. There they are, model after model after model being seen. And by the way, uh, Francesco is a jerk. He is not a charming prince. He is not very likable at all, in fact. He insults so many of the models unnecessarily just because they're not his new inspiration. Hmm, rude. And of course, he doesn't seem to notice Kelly. Well, he lives in the world of models. Who's going to look at the work shirts and the glasses? <laughs> so this is, this is her, her qualms. She has an interview with Francesco in the morning and goes to sleep and dreams that he notices her and offers her champagne and dances with her. But then the dream becomes a nightmare and now everyone's laughing because she's in her work clothes and uh-oh, she wakes up and she is late. So off she runs. She takes a pair of shoes that she's designed. They're sparkly and silver and uh, they will be important later. And she heads out. And then we meet an eccentric lady in the park who is asking everyone for directions, but everyone's just too busy to help her. This takes place in Paris, by the way. So they're in Paris, everyone's too busy. Our Kelly comes running out and she is late. She ain't got time for this crazy lady. Not that the lady is crazy, it's just that, you know, um, she's our fairy godmother. She's testing people. She's dressed eccentric and she's got crazy sunglasses. Those are legitimately crazy. I think the first pair she wears is flamingos. They're a lot of fun. And of course, Kelly is like, oh no, oh no, oh no, please don't ask me for help. But the lady does. And then she can't help but help her. In doing so, the lady nearly gets hit by a car. So Kelly pushes her out of the way, drops her papers in the gutter, drops her shoes. They get hit by a car. Now her shoes are broken. Her day is ruined. She's late for the interview. She won't be seen because Francesco is having a meltdown. Ah, <sighs> last, there go her hopes and dreams, or so she thinks. 
Now Francesco's looking for his new face. Kelly is right under his nose because she technically works for him, but she doesn't do the design work. She's just one of the dressers. And she is trying to get noticed, but um, what's the word? He doesn't see her, but he notices her because after having a meltdown on the floor and crying about how nothing inspires him, he talks to her because she's in the room playing with a rack. <laughs> that sounds funny. Playing with a rack of clothes. And this is the second time in the film that he's noticed her without noticing her. She introduces herself and he's like, that's nice, bye. And he's out because he's not a nice guy. And I think this is an important thing to recognize. People don't have to be nice or likable for other people to like them. This is something that movies, we moralize characters. You should like this character because of what they exemplify. You should like this character because of what they do for other people. Or you shouldn't like this character because they are a meanie and a bully. That's not how it works in real life. Lots of people like people who are unlikable for reasons. And I think in this movie, the reason she likes him so much is he's an incredible designer who's built up an incredible fashion house. On that note, his fashion house, and I don't mean his brand, Salvatore, I mean his mansion, looks like the Cinderella castle in Disney. So that's a fun little Easter egg. But she admires and esteems him. And then he's played by Rob Lowe in his prime. So, you know, he's very handsome, <laughs> if incredibly ridiculous and egotistical. Okay. So, tomboy Kelly is like, wah, no one ever notices me. And her friend is like, maybe what you need is a makeover. And as they're making her over, we see our eccentric fairy godmother just popping up all over Paris, watching over her. She's a mannequin. Now she's a charwoman. Then she's just traveling in the streets. Well, eventually, after another meltdown, Rob Lowe spends a lot of time on the floor in his robe, just having an existential crisis. <laughs> uh, the eccentric fairy godmother shows up at his chateau and pulls her, I'm looking for directions spiel. Then he's like, well, you're clearly in the wrong place. She tests him twice, something she hasn't done for other people. And he passes the second test. Now she's inspired him to throw a party at his place and this is his scheme. He'll throw a ball to find the fresh face that he's been looking for. Now everyone in town is trying to be the next model and Kelly's friend Veronique has stolen a dress and she's like, let's go crash this party right now. And Kelly's like, I can't go. I can't wear that dress. It's borrowed. But her friend is like, come on, do it. It'll be fun. And then heads out. And Kelly's like, I guess I'll do it. But she's very down on herself the whole time. She showers, she washes her hair, she dries her hair. And she's like, I guess this is all we can do with. But you know, she doesn't really like style herself. She doesn't make herself up. She wants to be in the world of fashion, but she herself does not want to be fashionable. Or she wants her fashion of plain Jane wore my dad's clothes to work. Isn't it neat? to take the world by storm. And it just doesn't, especially not Paris in 1990. I don't know if the year matters, but you know, Paris is the fashion hub. Okay, the dress, here we go. <laughs> wow, it is, um, well, it's silver and fitted up top. It's silver and pink. And then the skirt is like a fluffy tulip skirt with sort of chiffon and sparkles and kerchiefs and I can see why his fashion house is failing because yikes it's very 1990s but she wears it and she wears the shoes the shoes that she made the shoes that were broken but suddenly they're fixed yes it turns out that very same day she met up with the eccentric lady again the eccentric lady put a little Put a little magic in those shoes because now and she puts on the shoes she completely transforms it, it, it's a little something like this. Wow, look, a shoe. I think I'll put it on. Oh my goodness, I'm a supermodel now. All because of these shoes I'm wearing. Wow, wow. So she's on her way to the ball, all decked out. A cabbie, it's the eccentric fairy godmother, picks her up in an orange cab, in which is the most adorable reference to Cinderella's pumpkin that I've ever seen. And we make our way to the fashion house. 
Now the shoes don't just change the way she looks. They change her appearance, her eyes. They change from brown to a powdery blue. So when she arrives, and Francesco zeroes in on her immediately, she sees her friend, and her friend is like, I don't know you, woman. Who are you? And Kelly's like, but it's me. What? Her friend is the first person to say, you don't look like you. Francesco notices her, woos her, and it's just like her dream. In fact, it's better than her dream because in the dream, it turned into a nightmare. But here, it's reality. They dance, they drink champagne. He makes her the next face of Francesco Salvatore. And now, after showing her off at the ball as the new face of his line, he is signing her, or his fashion house is trying to get her to sign papers, and he's just like, she's my inspiration, be gone, I must sleep with you tonight. Kelly's like, oh my word, heavens no, I mustn't, I must resist. And of course, it's, you know, she resists, so he wants her more. I'm getting very sick of that trope. But there's this moment where he's like, why do you resist me? And her simple answer is, prudence. But he decides Prudence must be her name. So then we have supermodel Prudence and tomboy designer Kelly Carter. So these shoes are magic shoes. He compliments them. He notices them right away. And she's like, oh, they were designed by my friend, Kelly Carter. Yes. Then she runs away, as you know, you must do when midnight strikes and leaves a shoe behind. But because she mentioned who designed the shoe, Francesco shows up at Kelly's apartment the next day. So Kelly is back and Francesco's in her place, waking her up with a shoe in his hand going, where is Prudence? Where is Prudence? Well, now she's got to fake this whole Prudence was here, but now she's gone. Ha 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 ha. And he's like, if you see her, you must send her to me. She's my new model. She's my new face. So. It's at this moment that Veronique and Kelly discover it's the shoes that cause her to transform. The lights physically go on and off whenever the shoe goes on. So every time she puts on the shoes, the lights go on and off and uh, her eyes change. So I get it. It doesn't matter that she has the same face. If you see someone with completely different eyes, that's all you really need to be like, well, that's clearly a different person. If I had a pair of shoes that changed my eye color, I would accessorize that with everything I had everything all right so now now she shows up as prudence and they strike a deal and she's like i'll be your model if you hire kelly carter to be one of your designers and they're all like hop, 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 whoa, we don't just hire amateurs but they do so now kelly is working close with francesco and now francesco is developing a kinship with kelly because he respects her as a designer and he likes the way that she interprets his work and genuine kinship develops here she anticipates his needs there's a whole scene in which he's asking his entourage the time and kelly just offers him a watch a ridiculous watch with a smiley face on it which doesn't go with his fashion line at all but we see him wearing it later in the film. So Kelly is developing meaning in his life while Prudence is this elusive model beauty that he lusts after. He's got a date with Prudence and he's wooing her with everything he's got. An orchestra, an expensive meal, dinner and dancing at his chateau, which of course leads to some canoodling. And well, that's where we hit our first bump. You see, Prudence, almost loses her shoe during that and almost transforms back into her Kelly self and realizes, oh, I'm not quite ready to let the jig up yet. So she runs home and Francesco's like, we'll just wait. And now Kelly's getting pissed because Francesco doesn't wait for anyone, but he's waiting for Prudence? Hell no. That's right. Now she's getting pissed that he doesn't seem to recognize that she is the same woman that he is lusting after. And then we really hit a snag when he starts expecting Kelly to be in the room while they're dressing Prudence. And she's got to go running back and forth, putting the shoe on, taking the shoe off. I'm the designer. I was in the back room. Oh, I'm swooning. Wow. He never seems to notice that they're never in the same room at the same time. In fact, eventually she has to sort of fake being a body while being Prudence, while being Kelly all at the same time, just to get him off the track. And now... The giant fashion show is coming up and Veronique, her friend, is like, you know what? 
I think we should get rid of Kelly. I think Prudence should take over because Prudence is being offered these supermodel gigs and is making way more money and everyone wants Prudence. Who wants Kelly? What does Kelly have to offer? And that's when she says a lot. Kelly has a lot to offer. So now Kelly has come to a decision. It's time. Either I go or Prudence goes, but you can't have us both. So she says that, she says that to Francesco. Look, I've designed an outfit with this pair of shoes. Kelly designed an outfit with a pair of shoes that she made, she created, they're her pride and joy. But Veronique is like, honey, if you wear those shoes, you won't be Prudence anymore. And that's when Kelly realizes one of them is gonna have to go. She can't go her entire life always wearing this pair of shoes just to be loved and appreciated. She needs to be loved and appreciated for who she is. All right, now that's when Veronique is like, well, everyone wants Prudence. Everyone's offering money to Prudence. I think Prudence should stay. Ooh, not her best friend moment. But this is when Kelly realizes I have to be myself because I cannot be this other woman for the rest of my life. It's not who I am. So she goes out there. She tells Francesco, Prudence refuses to wear the shoes. She says they're hideous. And he's like, what? We'll talk to her. And Kelly says, look, you're gonna have to decide. Either she goes or I go. And he's like, well, this is a very expensive shoot and she's our model, so I guess you gotta go. And then Kelly rips him a new one. She's like, you know what? You're surrounded by phonies. I'm the only one who's ever truthful with you. You don't know how to appreciate life. I'm out. And she leaves and she puts on the shoes and puts on this whole snob act. I refuse to wear these shoes. They're disgusting. I hate them. And it's when she says this as Prudence that Francesco realizes the significance of Kelly in his life. Sure, he wants Prudence, but he needs Kelly. He needs her approval. He needs the way she works with him and helps him. And when Prudence says that, he delivers this speech of what these shoes represent, hard work and creativity and design. That's something she wouldn't know anything about. Looks fade, sweetheart. Ugh. Okay, so now he's decided Prudence isn't gonna be in his life and he goes after Kelly and she's out there walking along the Seine. She spends a lot of time by the river. That's our connection to nature in this film. He goes out to Kelly by the Seine. He tells her that she's who really matters in his life. Oh, and then they share a kiss and she tosses the shoes into the Seine, which really just means she polluted publicly in the river. But okay, we get it. She's releasing Prudence back into the wild. She doesn't need magic shoes. She's got her man and her dream job in Paris. And then we see the eccentric fairy godmother in her new sunglasses like smiling and winking and nodding and saying goodbye because she's done all that she can do and that is if the shoe fits it's delightful it is silly it is a uh, modern cinderella her name is not cinderella but you know i guess in this one it's less about the grief of who she's surrounded by and it's more about the grief of not being seen for who she is because of expectations and finding her self-worth and knowing that she had a lot to offer the world and she was just gonna show up as she is. We have the amazing transformation sequence. We have legitimately magical shoes. Oh yes, our prince of fashion is ridiculous and he has a lot to learn, but he's not even a little bit perfect at all. He's definitely not a prince charming. What's the opposite of charming? Uh, repugnant, okay, he's not repugnant, but he's definitely a prima donna, the prima donna prince. But this is a fun, modern retelling, and it really, it brings us back to the whimsy. It is about allowing magic to show up in the darndest places. It's about being who you are, no matter what that looks like. And beyond that, to recognize that we all have something to offer. We all have something to offer. Now you can watch If the Shoe Fits, available on Amazon Prime with commercials, but free. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you can find it on YouTube. I did not check that before I started telling you, so I better look and put a link down below if it's true. If the Shoe Fits, oh, Cinderella's. What will we do next time? Haven't worn these in a while, whoa.